I'm very excited to um, bring in uh, Free State Government Information, uh, which is a blog and a group that's been working on um, issues in copyright and state government information. And they're going to present or talk about themselves and tell you who they are. Our basic uh, coverage of the issue today will be about copyright and state government. Good morning, um, or almost afternoon for some of you. It's morning for me here on the West Coast. Uh, we are very happy to have a chance to talk with this group about copyright and state government information. Um, we're covering, I know these, these uh, webinars tend to be um, geared towards kind of more practical um, services side, but what we're talking about today is more of the back end policy issue um, dealing with state government information and copyright. Um, this is our agenda for uh, today. Um, I would like to actually, before we launch into this, just get a sense of who we have in our group. Um, how many of you are working with digitization projects or web um, archiving projects that involve state government information? Um, so as Linda said, um, we're going to introduce ourselves. Collectively, we go by Free State Government Information, or FSGI, but individually, we are Bernadette Bartlett, Kyle Courtney, Christina Eden, and myself, Chris Kasinovich. With the exception of Kyle, um, <laughs> none of us are lawyers, nor do we play one on TV. Um, you can see what our titles are here. So all of us have had or, or actually work with state government information in some capacity as part of our regular jobs. And of course, we run into the issue of copyright um, law when dealing with these materials. Um, given our various experiences, and I would actually say more like frustration with state government information and copyright, we came together to figure out a way to bring clarity and ideally change the copyright policy landscape across the 50 states with regards to state government information. And so that's why we came together as Free State Gov Info. So we want to go over the what and the why here, give you some context. Um, first. I want to clarify and make sure everyone knows this. Uh, when we deal with state government documents or state government information, um, we're talking about publications and not records. Um, we know that when you're dealing with records, and you can see this down at the bottom of the screen, this is kind of a word cloud of the kinds of things we're talking about. Records um, have some different issues involved with them, but when we're talking about um, getting materials, state government materials, um, either in the public domain or getting some kind of clarity with their copyright status and how they can be used. Um, we really are talking about those publications. So they're published and distributed materials. They're print online or they could be in any other format. You probably have a lot of CDs, DVDs. Uh, there's stuff from floppy, microfiche. Um, and it's for the public's consumption. Oftentimes, you'll hear um, it referred to as state government information, state government publications, state documents. And a lot of times, we even hear um, people call them records when actually what they're really talking about are publications. <clears throat> so we're not really talking about the records, so the emails, memoranda, correspondences, um, or anything like that that the public would have to file a formal Public Records Act request to get. Um, so simply put, in case you were unclear before this webinar, um, given the way the copyright law is written, state government information is copyrighted. Um, we may not think it should be, I don't think it should be, um, but it is, so we have to deal with this. Um, a lot of people out there um, believe that state, and I'm going to throw in local government information, is in the public domain just like the federal government information is. But in reality, state and federal government documents are not alike when it comes to copyright law. So Section 105 of the U.S. Code, Title 17, um, if any of you work in a, a federal depository library, you probably are very familiar with this. It gives us very simple and direct assurance that works of the United States government are not subject to copyright in the United States. However, if you look at that Section 105 language, it doesn't say a single word about state government documents. So state government documents are not considered works of the United States government. So by default, full copyright protection attaches from the moment of a state document's creation. So just like a novel or anything else out there. So unless there is state legislation to the contrary, per Section 102, 
uh, A, which covers the subject matter of copyright. State government information has copyright protection um, from the instant it is fixed in any tangible medium of expression. Beyond the default set in the Copyright Act, states can and do exert copyright over their publications, and they may have their own laws, rules, or policies that address intellectual property rights of state government information. And Kyle's going to address this in a little bit more detail in his section about the State Copyright Resources Center. So um, to kind of drive this point home a little bit better, um, if you look here, we've got um, the public domain for federal government information. So as soon as it's uh, published, it is in the public domain now. Um, for 50 states, it will be public domain in 2112. And the last concept we want to drive home to is the difference between publicly available versus public domain. So there's a bit of a misperception that we've encountered out there that a state statute or policy granting public access is equivalent to public domain. However, talking with the lawyers um, from Hathi Trust, and I believe Kyle is, as well, um, this does not relinquish copyright. Um, and Christina's going to go into more detail about this. So we've seen some statutes that say the material has to be publicly available, and the assertion is that since it's publicly available, it's public domain, and that's just not the case. So why are we doing this? Um, well, we all feel that state documents should be in the public domain or at least given some type of a Creative Commons type of license or something that better um, describes how those of us, say, in libraries and the public can utilize and distribute, um, digitize um, this material. These materials are created for the public typically using public funds, and should be treated in the same way as our federal government publications are. So um, we see this as copyright law styming our work and the work of others. And even the Google Book Project runs into this um, issue when dealing with state government publications. So um, over the past year and a half or so, our group has looked at how libraries are handling this issue. Um, we've got some immediate um, approaches, and then we're also looking at some longer-term approaches here. So um, a lot of what gets done is we seek permission. Um, so you actually contact state agencies and um, you know, ask them, can we digitize? Can we put these materials up in our institutional repository? Um, this is time-consuming, as you can well imagine, because you've got to find the right person at the right agency, um, give them the permission notice, and ask for them to respond to that, and that can involve getting their legal counsels involved. Um, other people uh, we've seen use something called a takedown notice. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this if you do web archiving. Um, so they will scan and make state documents available but they'll put a statement up on that site saying that they believe it to be in the public domain, and if that's not the case, the agency can get in touch with them to, you know, sort out the details. Um, and then there's also a copyright review, um, and this would be following the changes to copyright law, looking for copyright marks on publications um, based on, um, we actually look at Peter Hurdle's um, copyright um, charts is kind of a guidance, and Christina is going to cover this in more detail. Now, long term, <clears throat> we would actually like to see better solutions that would be clearer and fixed um, for the long term. Um, so we've worked over the past to get people involved, especially if they feel that they could bring about some type of um, legislative change in their state. So is there a way to have a law passed to get the um, uh, a copyright statement either clarified or declaring the materials to be put in public domain, um, or even through executive authority. Um, and I would just point out here that state legislation could change that U.S. copyright law default, but then again, it's got to be done at each state. So that's 50 states having to kind of introduce legislation and do that. Um, we've also talked about using Creative Commons. I mentioned this briefly. Um, if public domain designation is not palatable to state governments, 
Um, we've also talked about using the Creative Commons as a way to maintain control, but to still be very clear to users what they can and cannot do with the materials. Okay, so how are we doing this? Um, in addition to um, all of the kind of research we've done thus far and the, the discussions we've had with various groups, um, at our own institutions, we are grappling with this. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the perspective and projects from academic institutions. Um, and Bernadette um, and Christina will cover um, how they're handling this in each of their areas. So we are considering Hopi Trust as a digital library. And Bernadette will be covering her perspective from a, a state library. And again, um, these are our perspectives from our own individual institution that hopefully um, you may find um, resonate with you, or you may also find that, hey, this is completely different. So we're not generalizing across for every state library that's out there or every academic institution. So at my library, um, which is a major academic research institution, um, many of our researchers want digital access to state government materials and local government. Um, materials in print. Um, I have a really good and recent example about a faculty-led project um, with studying state banking practices from 1920 to 1940. Um, and they requested that we digitize runs of the state banking um, reports, the, the annual reports from the, the banking commission. Um, it's a fairly reasonable request, um, given that we do have the means to digitize and do mass digitization here at our campus. Um, and I would also note that the trend since about the mid-aughts has been for state and local governments to publish their materials online only with no print distribution. So a lot of the work that we do is bringing together the online, the published online, and making the print materials um, digitally. So that way a researcher like this group would have a really nice um, data set of materials. Um, additionally, I'm also engaged in web archiving of government websites, um, and I also ran into this copyright issue um, in dealing with the web archiving. So to move forward with any of these projects at our institution, um, our general counsel requires us to seek permission from each agency. Um, and this is mainly because we do allow access to the materials through our catalog without any restrictions. Uh, we digitize the material, we put it into our institutional repository, and we pro provide access to the, the objects through um, our library catalog. Um, and I, on the screen here, you'll see I've put up a portion of what we send to the agency when we seek permission, um, so you get an idea of what we ask. Um, this language was actually um, vetted and approved by our deputy director and general counsel, and basically um, we just kind of tailor it to whatever the request is. We have some standard language. We send it in an email to whom we think is the appropriate person at the agency that can give us permission. And then we have to keep track of all of the, the permissions that we um, receive or don't receive. So finally, once we do put the material into a digital collection online, we do include a use and reproduction statement that indicates we have permission from the state to make the materials accessible but we don't say anything about public domain or creative commons, we do indicate that states may limit further use. Um, and so this is, in my eyes, it's not ideal, but it enables us to keep moving forward. If I had my preference, um, we'd probably do this differently. Um, but as I've noted, other institutions do use takedown notices. Um, some don't even bother with this, um, and they assert that the materials are in the public domain. So there's a variety of approaches out there, but this is how we're handling it here. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Christina um, to talk about her perspective. Thanks, Chris. So my name is Christina. I am Copyright Review Project Manager for Hachi Trust Digital Library. I've been working on the copyright for about four years. Um, if you don't know Hachi Trust, I'm, I'm assuming many of you do, but it's a partnership of primarily academic libraries, um, over 100 members. And the collection is contributed digital scans from the partners. And I looked up, we do have North Carolina State and North Carolina Central, our Hathi Trust partners. So perhaps we have something from those collections um, in Hathi Trust. So 
HathiTrust is primarily about preservation. We're, we're doing scanning of the works even in copyright under 108 for preservation purposes. And when they're taken in, um, an initial bibliographic determination is done to see whether or not they can be open to full view or whether they need to be closed for presumed in copyright. Um, so state documents coming in, um, if they're prior to 1923, they will be open and full view, and anything after 23 and later are presumed in copyright until we can um, find out more about them. So if they are closed, uh, that means that they are only keyword searchable. Um, nobody can view them in HathiTrust. And we started getting some inquiries from researchers who were very anxious to get access to the closed materials. Um, and we have been able to work with them to get uh, documents open. Um, I won't go so far as to say, call us, uh, you know, if you have a researcher interested in in getting some documents in HathiTrust open. We have a lot on our plate and we are working on stuff, but definitely you can um, email me if you have an inquiry about using some of the, the state information that is in HathiTrust if it's not open. Um, one of the things that we'll be working on soon, our Canadian Patent Office, uh, we had an inquiry for a researcher for those. Um, so typically we're able to provide access in one of two ways. We've uh, tried seeking rights holder permission to apply Creative Commons license and open the works. And the most productive for us has been doing copyright review on batches of documents and looking where to find they are public domain. We looked into state legislative language as a basis for opening some. Uh, however, the language has not so far been clear enough about documents being public domain for us to rely upon it in, in the case of a mass digitized library. So it tends to talk either about things being publicly available um, or in some cases it just has too many carve outs that we couldn't, we couldn't apply it across a batch of works. Um, uh, we have decided instead to do a copyright review pilot project. We identified about 60,000 works uh, in HathiTrust that were public um, state documents that were closed, and we've been working our way through that over the last year. Um, so this is how we're working on copyright review. We had a grant from IMLS, actually three grants, to develop an interface, and this is pulling documents directly from HathiTrust that are closed and we're reviewing the closed documents um, through the system, doing an analysis, and submitting a rights code back to the HathiTrust rights database. And this goes through overnight. If it is determined to be public domain, the document will be available and viewable in HathiTrust by the next day. Right, so we're getting really positive results. Uh, we're getting um, about 70, 70, over 70% 70 public domain. And the basis for our copyright review is um, a U.S. formality uh, for documents published between 1923 to 1977 must contain a copyright notice. Technically, the requirement went through 1989. However, um, that later period, there was a, an ability for them to do a remedy within five years, um, and which would be an extra research step for us. So we're not working on those through 89 right now. We're just sticking through 77. Uh, and that still gives us a candidate pool of around 60,000 uh, documents to work on. So here are the results that we're seeing. In looking for no copyright notice in the front matter and in the back matter of state publications, we're getting about 73% public domain, meaning they were published without copyright notice. 27% um, end up in our undetermined needs further investigation. That is typically because they contain uh, adjunct materials such as photographs, um, things that could be from another agency, um, perhaps um, a foreign authorship on it. And we're really finding very few that have, that are published with notice um, and that are in copyright. So we've been able to open up about 13,000 state documents since May of 2014. And again, finding about over 70% public domain. So this for us has been the best approach. Uh, some of the interesting things that we're finding are 
Quite a few of the state documents are not published with notice. The cases in which they are tend to be where there is a, um, a state partnership with a corporate entity doing the publication. Um, in some cases, this has been state annotated code. The code itself would be public domain for being enacted law of the state. However, with annotations, um, it could be copyrightable. Um, and when there has been publication with a corporate entity, it has more likely to have contained copyright notice and have been renewed uh, for copyright. Um, we also saw uh, a number of records of the Supreme Court um, court decisions, um, which had been published through a corporate agency, which also contained copyright notice. Um, so just saying, when you've got um, state government and private partnerships, um, there has been a tendency for more likely to view it as, as copyrighted than just states publishing it alone. We've also seen reports published with, uh, it clearly states that it's published with federal funding or it's published in cooperation with a federal agency and where under Section 105 uh, publications of the federal government would not be eligible for copyright. Because of that joint authorship with a state agency, we're considering that that has a joint author that does have copyright or could potentially have copyright. And therefore, even when you've got a partnership with a federal department, um, we still have to go through a copyright review. Um, in particular, looking at um, research from um, the Great Lakes area, we've also seen um, joint authorship with foreign um, researchers. Uh, for us, it would be Canadian. And when you've got foreign authorship on a document, uh, there could be other issues such as um, restoration, uh, copyright restoration through treaty, um, even if they failed to follow the formalities of US copyright um, during that time. So, you know, we're getting a lot of good results. We're, we're planning on continuing this for as long as possible. We've got over 40,000 left to work on. Um, and we do like to hear, you know, when people are interested or when people are using state government documents in Hathi Trust that helps build a case for working on these and knowing that they are valuable to people. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bernadette um, to talk about um, State of Michigan Library. I am the Michigan Documents Librarian at the Library of Michigan. So I deal with copyright and state documents from um, multiple arenas. Uh, of course, I'm often talking to the agencies themselves as creators and distributors, and then also um, helping my, our staff in-house deal with copyright issues, and then, of course, uh, users, uh, researchers, and other libraries as well. In Michigan, statute and case law does support the state's right to copyright its work. Um, but unfortunately, there's not really good follow through at the state level on that. There's, um, I do think the state government could improve their delivery of copyright information and services. Copyright is generally asserted and defined through policy, but there's a lot of ambiguities, um, especially across the three different branches of government. There's no uniform language or point of view regarding copyright. Um, of the three branches, the executive branch is the most clear and concise, um, laying the responsibility for getting permission on the user. And then the legislative branch has more of a, uh, is more concerned with whether someone thinks that they're infringing on someone else's copyright. And then the judicial branch, I don't, even think it sounds like a copyright um, policy at all. So that lack of consistency, that lack of uniformity, I think is um, very misinformative and makes it difficult for users. And I won't say that each branch intentionally has a different perspective, but uh, there's just a real lack of clarity. Uh, and it's, it's a hard um, issue to navigate at state government level. In addition to this, there's no training or education component for state employees 
on how to inform them, how copyright impacts their work, their agency's information sharing practices, or how to address user requests related to copyright. And I do think there is definitely an opportunity within administrative law, such as rules, policy, and procedure, to establish standardized practice and provide an informed and uh, consistent response to copyright-related queries. Until a few months ago, I would have said that copyright was not on state government's radar. And I still think that is true the majority of the time, as it is not often addressed at the individual state agency level. However, um, there are some indications that the agency that sets policy on Michigan.gov, which is the state's primary or official state government portal, and then also sets policy administratively for all executive branch agencies, um, that they may be paying more attention to copyright. They recently used the most specific language I have ever seen since I've been following the issue, um, expanding on a general statement about complying with intellectual property laws to specifying the types of use not allowed without permission. And they actually used the phrase to um, saying that creating derivative works is not permissible except under law which tells me that someone actually has looked at copyright law when they wrote that policy. And then there's also been uh, an internal policy that came out with restrictive copyright uh, language that really could affect other state government libraries, including the Library of Michigan, in doing uh, things like document delivery and, and interlibrary loan issues. So uh, we're keeping an eye on that just to see just to see what happens. The role of the State Library is that, in Michigan, by statute we serve as the State Documents Repository with obligations to capture, preserve, and provide access to state government publications. Unfortunately, the statute does not include any exemption or mention of copyright with regards to these obligations. So technically, we operate under the same copyright limitations as any other creator or user of state government information. We are following the lead of Hadi Trust and the Copyright Review Project, as, as um, Christina just talked about. And we are operating under the premise that most Michigan documents are free of copyright through 1977 because they did not follow the formalities for the most part. Um, unless there's mitigating factors such as an actual copyright statement, which is, is rare, or authorship of the document is shared with a non-government entity, then, you know, then we, uh, we, of course, pay more attention at that point. We're also a source um, of perspective on copyright and information on copyright. We're a common point of contact for state government and the public for questions uh, regarding copyright and state government information. We're careful not to cross the line into advice, but uh, in many cases there's not really anybody else out there to ask. We are also a provider of born digital and digitized state government information. Um, since 2006, the designated format for a Michigan document in the depository program has been electronic, and we preserve and provide access to archived born digital and digitized state government content on a site called Governing Michigan. On Governing Michigan, we offer a typical warning that the info available there may be, that the information available there may be protected by copyright, as well as a takedown notice and a redaction procedure as well. Um, if we've, we have taken on some large scale um, digitizing projects for state agencies, cooperating with other state agencies, and um, I always open a dialogue with them to talk about copyright and make sure that they understand um, what we're doing by putting this information up there and make sure that we can get permission if, if, they, if we need it. If an agency is reluctant or specifically requests that we also use the built-in digital rights management system features or limited IP access to restrict access to items in line with the fair use standard. 
Um, for state documents that are already freely available online or were freely distributed in print, we don't worry about copyright over much as it relates to our activities in preserving and providing access to state government information. We're relying on the protections afforded libraries under copyright law and assuming that one state government agency is not going to sue another. Um, however, with these recent policy changes, you know, we do need to be aware of that issue and it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the feedback is from those queries. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle. Hey, thank you very much. We, uh, obviously, the problems that have been outlined um, are, are affecting all of us uh, across libraries, academic, state, public, or otherwise. Um, so, you know, my role at Harvard University is copyright advisor, working with all 73 libraries, and occasionally issues like this would come up. One of them in particular that kind of piqued my interest before I even was aware of, of, of the group FSTI was the Graduate School of Design wanted to digitize these rare urban planning reports. So these are things that scholars have been wanting to get their hands on for a number of years. Uh, but again, these urban planning reports are generally authored by state commissions in some capacity. Uh, and it was very difficult to track this. And some of these urban planning reports are, you know, the very foundation of what we call, the, you know, the suburbs here today, ranging from uh, the early 50s to the 70s. And so we started to dive into the research of this particular problem, focusing on, well, what states do we have covered in these urban planning reports, and how can we perhaps work them out? Um, ideally, wanting to green light a lot of this stuff, which a lot of my colleagues want to do. We want to, we want the most yeses we possibly can um, for our patrons. We discovered that Ashley Messenger, and she is the lawyer for NPR uh, out of DC, um, and she wrote a, a mini article in uh, a journal called Communications Lawyer in 2013, basically talking about you know the questions she gets uh, with regard to her reporters for NPR. Can they reprint state materials to uh, supplement their their articles and stories? Uh, and she worked with an intern and did about uh, five or six states, as I recall, just looking into them, uh, which was a great start for us. So I, I called Ashley and and I, I I give her a huge shout out for kind of starting this research. And after you didn't happen to do the 45 other states uh, when you had your project in the summer with your intern, and she said no, but if you wanted to do that have at it. And so we very much did want to do this. We thought it would be uh, a, a research um, guide that would be very useful for a community, I think, far beyond what we had imagined, but obviously we were focusing on uh, our library's problem initially. So in 2014, we hired Katie Zimmerman, who is a librarian that is going back to law school. Uh, she's actually graduating this May. And we hired her to do what we refer to as a scorch the earth type research where we looked at all 50 states, uh, you know, D.C. and Puerto Rico, um, and tried to determine, you know, what was the answer to the question of whether or not they assert copyright, uh, states assert copyright over their materials. And we recorded all our data, we wrote it up, we, we developed a score, which I'll share with you, and some of our analysis, and we talked about potential solutions. Our area was we were focusing on our work with model legislation to, to pick to fix some of this, and I'll talk more about that. And then, along with the rest of the office that I work in, the Office for Scholarly Communications, we had uh, two developers uh, build this website and make it accessible to the world uh, so that we can share our results. Um, if you could advance the next slide, Chris. So these results were kind of interesting, but they were about really interesting works of state government. I would like to point this out. The stuff that our scholars want to get at is stuff that's not necessarily seen this often. Again, we have the State Development Plan Program, statewide housing elements. You can click again, Chris, that would be great. There's uh, definitely a, a variety of, uh, there we go, um, states that produce this stuff, which again, sits on our shelves and, you know, they can't do much with them unless they, they go to your place. And in some places, and I'm lucky to have uh, an institution which collected from all 50 states for a long time in this arena, we have stuff that the states themselves don't even have. Uh, so we want to get that. And some of the more interesting ones is we also have third-party materials inside some of these. 
This is one of my favorites. Uh, the affluence of youth and their mobility. This is from a report uh, by Governor Reagan at the time period when he was in California, just talking about when these young people get accessibility to cars, how does that change the scope and fabric of our highways and our systems? Um, and again, so these are just really unique items, which we want to clarify in some capacity um, for our scholars to, to give them oversight. We decided to build this uh, research center which address these factors. Now, this is what we looked at when we gave what is ultimately referred to as an openness score. Now, the factors addressing the score, as you can see, we looked at a lot of this stuff. Now, finding a lot of this stuff was half the battle, and that's why this Scorch the Earth Research Project we wanted to share with the world. But we would look whether or not that uh, openness existed in the state constitution whether or not there was some sort of ban on commercial use. We looked at a lot of advisory body language. So often there would be a committee that had something to do with copyright or intellectual property or openness or public records in the state. And finding those was a challenge, but useful. And of course, many states actually asked their very own attorney general the same question that we asked. So attorney general opinions were important, we had policy statements, and then probably my favorite, the statement of the state archives or state libraries, um, what were our peers at state institutions talking about when they did this? So we did address a lot of these factors, and we boiled that in into our overall map. And this is available. You can, you can click on the link and go there right now, copyright.live.harvard.edu slash states. Um, and what this is is our score. As you can see, there's there's not a ton of green up there, <laughs> but green indicates the documents are presumptively in the public domain per some important statement, policy, et cetera. Uh, but again, we balanced it all out. We balanced out case law, statutes, opinions, uh, lots of other stuff. And so I just wanted to take you through this site very briefly here so you can see what we uh, address as we do this. On every single state um, has the same exact uniform approach in that we are looking for relevant laws, legal sources that affect the copyright status of government documents. And each state will have some or all of the following information. So we look to the copyright status, open the score, binding law, advisory sources, and public related law. Now again, we have an overall bibliography for the topic as a whole and a state-specific bibliography for, for the topic restricted to that state. And I'd like to talk about the openness score here. If you just advance the slide, Chris. The openness score is a quantification of all these factors we've identified. And, you know, I went to law school, so I didn't have to do any more math, but it turns out I had to do some more math. Um, we calculated the score by quantifying the arguments and factors related to the copyright status um, and the same factors we described in that text, whether it's the opinions, the advisory opinions, the Constitution, et cetera. And these factors are based on the major court cases that were considered when a few states were asked this exact question, what is the copyright status of government documents? And these cases were New York, Florida, California, and South Carolina. Those state cases uh, did an overarching survey of where they would look inside their own state to determine this. And so we took those factors and amplified them across all 50 states. And so the openness score that we give is this is the score of that quantification. It measures the standard deviations of a state, above or below the average across all of the states. And so if you advance this, the, the copyright guide itself is an interactive guide to these states' policies. Uh, we do uniformity in presentation, so there's no confusion. It's fully accessible. Uh, we have a text backup, so those with uh, JAWS or other programs that are print-disabled uh, or, or low vision can access it. It's also mobily accessible. It links as much as we could possibly to the laws, cases, and regulations that were open. Now, the irony in this is that some of the laws themselves are actually copyrighted, um, so we couldn't link to those. Uh, but I just wanted everyone to know that we did our best to open our links to the most open sites available so that you can read what we read when we did this. And we cross-reference frequently between states if they have adopted similar policies. Um, and it is fully updatable. In fact, we have already received updates um, from certain states. Uh, where we could access more codes or laws that have been passed. And the intent there is that is, this is a living resource. The State Copyright Resource Center uh, is going to be adaptable over time. It's not just a snapshot 
of 2014. It's going to be adaptable over time. So I figured I'd take us through just a particular state. Um, if you could advance the slide, Chris. New York is a classic red state um, in the CAC, not on the political spectrum, but on the spectrum of our openness score. So when we take a state, we say, what's the law? Is there any binding on-point law that's available? And we, this one happens to be the County of Suffolk, um, New York versus First American Real Estate Solutions. This was a fundamental case in this arena, which mandated basically said, yes, you know, there is the ability for states to copyright specifically on an agency level. But we also always look, despite the fact that there may be on-point case law, we also look at the advisory sources. We also look at the public record law, because even though that's not necessarily on point, it has an influencing factor. We also say, does the public record law restrict the use of disclosed records? We do a big survey on this, and we have specifics and examples. Many states have freed up certain things and not other things, and we try to outline that. So if there's copyrights in a statute, copyrights in the judicial syndrome, if they're using Creative Commons in some capacity, for certain types of uh, output that they're making, whether they're not reports, uh, legislation, committee, we note that. We note how it applies to a specific type of document and if it's based on a particular field of law. And again, we've done this for every state. If you could advance again, Chris. We also include things that you may want to consider when you're making your policy decisions um, in that the state legal code may say different things. And this is what's kind of interesting. Some states, are doing one thing publicly and then saying another in their cases or statute. Um, and when we, we have actually calculated the data on this, and we call this a ripeness for change score, meaning they're acting as if they're open, but yet also asserting copyright at the same time. Um, that can be kind of confusing. And then at the end, obviously, if there's where else you may want to go or other states you may be interested in that are similar, and then we have our Scorch the Earth bibliography of every single case, law, et cetera, and if you'd advance that, Chris, please, um, which includes statutes, attorney general opinions, um, committee reports, um, other, as we like to say, um, and you know, we include footnotes when available, when necessary of this. And again, the intent here is, by the way, to link to as many open documents and laws as we can so you don't hit a paywall or have to go through LexisNexis or some other database. And we do that specifically because that's the point of the project. Now, I'd like to share with you just um, some sample survey results and analysis here of how we generated these particular scores. These are interesting. So when we looked at the state constitutional provisions, when we were applying a score to the state, we gave you a plus one. We gave your state a plus one if there was a universal right of access included in the state constitution. Uh, we gave you a minus 0.5 if the right of access included was only for specific records. You know, it only freed in a few areas. Um, we also did uh, the purpose. If there's a purpose statement, it includes the concept of public ownership of documents, we felt like, well, that's a leaning towards what we want, and so we gave that a plus one. And we gave a minus one if the statement of specifically excludes the intellectual property of the state. As you can see, though, um, in that column, 58% of all the states we looked at had a statement that described public access to records as valuable, but focuses on transparency rather than the property themselves. And we found a lot of blurring lines in that area, but we still helped, thought it helped influence those decisions. One of the other interesting ones is the uh, library and archives factor here, which is my favorite one. I assume everyone's favorite one uh, that's on the line. If there's a clear public domain statement by the state library or state archives, we give you a plus one. Um, if there was a clear proprietary statement, we give you a minus one. But as you can see, 52% of the nation's state libraries or state archives had no real policy statement. Uh, they, they kind of ducked it. But the interesting example in this is, is from South Carolina. South Carolina is the most recent state with a judicial decision on the copyright status of their government documents. Um, from 2008, and they based it on the New York Suffolk County, which was red, as I showed you before. But this was interesting. They held that, yes, state entities are not prohibited from maintaining copyrights for state public records, but South Carolina State Library, however, has one of the clearest library policy statements of a country that says the South Carolina State Library considers records, documents, and information made available by the agency of the South Carolina State Government to be in the public domain according to U.S. copyright law. 
So we consider that a very uh, a powerful statement, and it highlights the important point that even though your state may say, yes, there is copyright that they can, you know, oversee on their documents, it doesn't mean that the conversation is over. It means that policy statements may be equally as important. Um, so that's part of it. So if you want to get involved in this and uh, you think this is interesting at all and would like to help us out if you advance the slide, Chris, we are doing a, uh, a call to arms, if you will, because um, we need you. And, and Chris will probably repeat this. Um, our greatest contacts in this arena are our local contacts. We, we will not be complete without our help from our fellow librarians, archivists, researchers, and others that are on the front lines in these states doing this work. You know, I, my first partner, the, when I started doing this and I found out about FSTI, I immediately thought, I need to join them, and they were happily <laughs> to let me join, and so we've been working on this together. But we need state-specific experts to help us develop, update, and improve this. And as we're talking with legislatures um, around the country, those advocates can really give us a hand. Uh, so thank you for listening to that. Check out the state copyright. And I believe I'm handing it back over to Chris now. All right, thanks, Kyle. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. Um, so I'm going to just blow through this um, next slide pretty quickly. But we wanted to let you know that part of the work we're doing, um, in addition to partnering up with Kyle and the fantastic resource that he put together, um, we've been trying to monitor other projects and issues that are impacting this area. Um, one of the big ones that's been out there is publicresource.org, which is run by Carl Malamud. Um, he, um, you may have read about him. He's actually being, um, there's a lawsuit with the state of Georgia over um, his release of, I believe it's the statutes of the state, um, putting them up publicly on his publicresources.org. A couple years ago, there was something that got passed by the Uniform Law Commission, which is the um, Electronic Legal Material Act, or ULMA, um, a Uniform Electronic Legal Material Act, and various states are adopting that. Um, there was a recent report that came out in 2015 by Sarah Glassmeyer on State Legal Information um, Census Report, which dealt with the issue of copyright specifically um, as a, um, like a, a speed bump to making information available and, and usable and accessible in the states. Um, the Free Law Project is out there, and they're mainly looking at scraping um, court websites and making um, court information freely available, and they're using a variety of tools where you can download through APIs. Um, we also have the Maine State Library, um, which was fantastic. They um, tweeted that they started um, using a CCO license um, for their materials um, in Coffee Trust. And we know that Ohio is currently trying to pursue a legislative solution. Um, the majority of the projects um, that we see here are really dealing with a lot of um, the primary legal materials, so the codes, the statutes, the constitutions, regulations, court records, um, and not all of the other materials that come from, say, the executive agencies, which that's a lot of the, the um, kind of the the meat or the tofu of the, the materials that a lot of our researchers want to um, access, as Kyle showed you, and from my example as well. Um, so again, we do want to put out a call um, to all of you to get involved with us. Um, as Kyle said, um, in order to keep the State Copyright Resource Center going and alive and thriving, um, if you've got information that you can share um, to enhance your state's information, that would be great. Um, we would love to hear if you are interested in pursuing any type of changes in your state, what you're doing, how we can support you um, with free state gov info. Um, and I think um, if you would like to get in touch with us, I know we didn't put up individual emails, but if you go to um, stategov.freegovinfo.info, there is a contact us form, and you can get in touch with us through that form. We're all um, monitoring that email, so um, you're very welcome to send us questions that way as well. I should also add that California just has a, <laughs> a piece of legislation that's being introduced. Um, came out last week, AB 2880, which they're trying to um, encourage state and local agencies to 
assert copyright over their materials. So I'm going to have work to do in California, I can see. Um, um, one thing that we would encourage you all to do as advocates for government information is to monitor what's going on in your state legislatures. Even though there's something already on the books, things can get introduced um, into the state legislature um, at any time. And a lot of times it's because your elected officials may not be aware of the issue. And so having the State Copyright Resource Center paid for your state at the ready um, to hand over to them is actually a really great resource. I know I've already started circulating it around with our state library, our archives, and even our legislative council um, office. Chris, I'm sorry, I, I gotta ask you a question. Did you say the bill was being introduced to assert copyright? Yes. <laughs> I'll send you, it's up on today. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> Yeah, I know. And it's funny because there is another bill that's making, it's been making its way through that does just the opposite. Um, clearly, those few assembly members aren't talking to each other. What's the justification they give for asserting? Um, I think a lot of it, from what I'm understanding, and I haven't actually read the, the bill yet, but according to the tech um, dirt article, I don't know if you know about Yosemite um, and the fact that there is a, kind of a, an issue of intellectual property right over the names at Yosemite, like the Awani Lodge. Um, the state gave the company who's running um, the resorts out there um, rights to those names. And so there's a, a kind of a legal battle at the moment as to who has rights over that. Um, and so I think they're saying that that's tied into kind of what's going on with this controversy um, in Yosemite, that state agencies can assert it so that way they don't lose um, control over their content and intellectual property. So there'll be more to come. I was, I was, I've been gone for the last two weeks out of the country and just came back and opened my email this morning and saw this article. So thank you very much for doing this. Thank you for attending. Yeah, thank you everybody for attending and uh, have a great Monday.